this afternoon uh, on Facebook, on YouTube, or on Panopto. We're on a hold right now to get the jurors into the Zoom space. As soon as we get the jurors into the Zoom space at uh, 2.55 p.m. Eastern time, we'll start um, the presentations. Good afternoon, I'm Brian Kelly, the Director of the Architecture Program. I'm here with Lindsay May, the Assistant Director of the Architecture Program, to bring you the architectural theses uh, for the fall semester of 2020. Before we get started, I'm required to tell everybody that this session is being recorded for limited distribution to students, particularly for future thesis students. 
so they have an opportunity to review what the end game looks like. If for some reason you don't want to be recorded, please mute yourself and uh, turn off your microphone, turn off your camera, or leave the meeting now. Presumably if you're on the Zoom end of this meeting, your reviewer or faculty member, that's really not an option. But uh, for those of you watching on YouTube or on Facebook or Panopto, this doesn't really apply to you. Sit back, enjoy. We're about to take you on a good ride through two thesis projects. So welcome once again to our Master of Architecture theses. We have two theses to look at this afternoon. Uh, we'll be looking at uh, these two urban scale theses, one by Tochi and the other one by Paris. Uh, and the fact that if you're out there watching this live today on YouTube, Facebook, or Panopto, we really have uh, one person to thank for this, our digital wizard, Fabian Gomez, who uh, is responsible for making sure that we're online and out there. We really thank you, Fabian, for the great job that you've done uh, this morning and continue to do this afternoon to ensure that people get a chance to see this presentation. Um, I want to thank our guest reviewers. We have Mike Ambrose, former colleague here from the University of Maryland, returning. He's in Raleigh, North Carolina. One of the advantages of this platform is we really get a chance to bring people in from all over the place. Uh, Fariz Giga uh, will be joining us in a moment if he hasn't already done so. Uh, from DSNR Architects in New York, Fariz gave a great lecture in the lecture series this past semester, and we've invited him back. Corey Henry, who is one of our key distinguished uh, professors who's joining us from Los Angeles, California. He was up very early this morning to hang out with us, and we're glad to have you back this afternoon. Corey will be back as an infomercial to those of you students out there that are looking for a great elective. Corey's going to be teaching a seminar course this coming spring at the school. Then we're uh, also joining us is Kevin Heinley, who's an architect at, uh, at Gensler. He's a principal and uh, manager of the um, of the uh, San Diego office for Gensler. Uh, Son Hee Kim, who's an architect uh, and um, uh, at Design Collective who specializes in sustainability topics. Um, this afternoon as well, we will have Chris Morrison joining us. Uh, we hoped, if, if Chris is uh, from Perkins and Will here in Washington, DC, uh, we hope to have Franco Pisani join us. He has a, 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 an appointment with his publisher that he cannot miss. Uh, so he's going to talk to his publisher and join us back in a, hopefully later this afternoon. He's from uh, ISI Florence, our affiliate in Florence, Italy. Um, and we also have Andrea Ponzi, former key professor uh, from Studio Ponzi uh, in Florence, Italy, also joining us. So welcome. Those are the reviewers that are with us this afternoon. Um, for the reviewers, for those of you that are just joining us, if you follow the link that I sent you on a separate email this morning, you'll find that there is a link to a spreadsheet as well as a whole series of PDFs. If you want to browse those PDFs at any point in time, feel free to do so. The PDFs are, uh, uh, are a kind of digital approximation of what it would be like if we were in the great space presenting in front of everybody. And uh, you, know, you get to see everything kind of at a glance. It's very synoptic. And the spreadsheet provides you with uh, essential information, the abstracts, the committee members, uh, the location of the thesis, and so forth. So hopefully that'll help to guide you through things. Uh, today, um, our, our thesis reviews uh, are dedicated to the memory of our colleague, Carl Dupuy, who left us uh, earlier this summer. Uh, Carl was slated to be the uh, individual directing students through this course of thesis this semester. I know that everybody um, uh, greatly misses Carl, uh, but I think all the folks that have presented here this morning, hopefully the, the, you'll agree this afternoon, uh, they've done his, his memory honor. So without any further ado, we'll get started. Um, and uh, we will get started with uh, Tochi. Um, and I will ask uh, Lindsay to take the screen over, make sure that you can, yep, you should be able to have the screen. Yep. And <coughs> all right. Hello, everyone. My name is Tochi Akawa, and I'm a master's in architecture and real estate development candidate. The following is my thesis called Aeropropolis, an airport as a driver of economic and urban development. Um, I'll start by introducing the idea and the concept and follow through with my design proposal and implementation strategy. Over the last few centuries, we've seen how 
transportation infrastructure has informed urban development and the construction of cities. Starting in the 18th century, how we saw with seaports, and now we're seeing how airports have started to shape um, cities and inform how urban developments um, are executed. What's going on in the 21st century? We're starting to see how biology and technology are taking over our day-to-day -day activities and how it's almost turning to the center of our lives and an exponential increase in air travel. And we expect to see um, twice as much as what we have now in 2035. There's also um, an increased need for um, mitigation of carbon emissions, as well as the need for connectivity uh, for businesses to the global market. Now, what's going on in San Diego? In San Diego, we're seeing um, an, a huge concentration of life sciences businesses, as well as technology, and a huge increase in tourism over the last few years. San Diego has almost become a hub for these sorts of businesses in the last few years. Now, what is a neurotropolis? It's a metropolitan subregion whose land use, infrastructure, and economy are centered on an airport. The concept is having the air terminal at the center and the airport city outside um, or within the airport's fence and the um, the aerotropolis outside the airport's fence surrounding the, um, the entire airport city. Now, a comparison between um, the 18th century port city, railroad city, the 19th century, and what we're seeing now, the 21st century aerotropolis, we can see a similar land framework or infer a similar land framework for the aerotropolis. With the airport city at the center and having programs such as offices closest to the airport city and other, um, other uses such as residential developments uh, farther away from the airport city. Now, major examples of aerotropoli around the globe today are Hong Kong International Airport, which is a model of aerotropolis three minutes away from the airport um, by, by light rail and ancient international airports Aerotropolis, which is called the New Songo Business District, which is a great example of an Aerotropolis, a business Aerotropolis. Now, taking a closer look at San Diego or the, um, the area surrounding the subject site, there is a proposed Grand Central Station, which would come up in the next few years, that intends to mitigate the amount of car trips from within the city to the airport. And in the next few years, it's going to see um, thousands of passengers flow through um, that, that piece of infrastructure daily. Also, you have the airport, which is the center of this conversation. Um, the passenger traffic is expected to double, almost double within the next 10 years. And um, it is currently the largest single runway airport in, in the country. Now, looking at the subject site, it is currently a Marine Corps recruit depot, which is a spot where um, Marine, uh, Marine are trained. And there's a decommission on the horizon because of the requirement for intergender um, training, which this facility currently cannot support. It does have a number of historic buildings, which would need to be preserved in the case of redevelopment. As you would imagine, the um, site is subject to stringent regulations, one of which is a requirement for um, the boundary protection zone. This stipulates that nothing can be constructed within a thousand feet from the railway center line. Also, the noise control strategies. As you can see in this diagram, residential uses cannot be constructed within the 75 decibel on contour. Now, the 2035 vision is um, a site which would be a full, a mixed use multimodal innovation campus, which allows its users live, work, and play in the same environment. The solar farm south of the site um, powers a considerable portion of the site, 
while also serving as a buffer from the runway. The site features a dynamic mix of uses, but more so life sciences than others. This clustering of similar businesses allows this clustering of similar businesses along with easy access to the airport allows for easy collaboration, productivity, and access to the global market. Now the satellite terminal on the east end of the site serves as an entry point for business executives and a departure point for products manufactured within the site. This axial connection on the site is a programmatic one as much as it is a physical one. It's a tech and retail corridor connecting the east um, and west ends of the site, as well as, as, well as the north um, and south ends of the site. So the center of this axis is an arrival space onto the site, which physically and programmatically announces the aerotropolis. So with technology exhibition and retail outside and within the structure, users can sort of have a good time while educating themselves on new technology. So this image sort of shows um, the users within the space and how they interact with, or how they can interact with technology while lingering around the space before you know, accessing the buildings potentially. Now, this, um, this image of the center space also shows or reiterates how uh, technology is displayed within the center space, which sort of announces what this development is all about. Now, the public parts of the building, like incubators and accelerators, have access from outside the arrival structure, while the restricted portions of the building, like the lab, um, have a checked direct access from the underground station um, up into the building, but um, with also and um, with also a sky lobby sort of acting as a buffer between the vertical circulation and the uh, um, and the restricted space. So this image captures the experience again of users interacting with technology on display, as well as um, you know, shopping on the ground level, as well as shopping from, as well as the shopping which users are going to do while accessing the ground level from the train station. Uh, talking about the, um, how this would be constructed, its phasing strategy. So first of all, the um, dilapidated barrack buildings would be demolished followed by an extension of Liberty Station's retail program onto the historic buildings. That means they will be repurposed for retail. Um, and then followed by an extension of the airport across the runway, allowing for the future development and manufacturing to have access to easy access to the global market. So next up would be the first phase of, of um, development, which would feature a mix of life sciences, residential, um, and industrial spaces, followed by a construction of the core of the, or the nucleus of the development. But this should occur when um, the Grand Central Station has been fully constructed. And then followed by the supporting residential and lodging district, which would sort of um, capture the entire, the entire character of this, of this development. And at full build out, here's an image of the of the site at full build out. In the interest of inhibiting or reducing vehicular network, this um, property only has one major thoroughfare through the site, connecting it uh, from the major highway to the rest of San Diego, as well as um, a network of secondary circulation which only runs through certain spaces and are restricted from certain spaces, enhancing the um, production experience within the site. Now, the green corridor serves as a space for, uh, for the users to sort of unwind and have access or better connection to nature. And, you know, employees or residents can come around and hang 
um, sort of during a lunch break or at any time of the day, as you can sort of see in this image. Now, this type of development makes the scientific discovery process more transparent and enjoyable. It also creates a cluster effect that causes more collaboration and productivity among businesses while affording them a competitive advantage in this modern era through an ease of access to the global markets via the airport. Um, so with that, I'll open the floor for questioning and uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, folks. So now uh, Tochi is available for questions, comments, critique, and we're get, we'll, get, we'll get a copy of the um, PDF up there for us to all look at. One question is, uh, uh, how did you figure out uh, the amount of uh, square footage or uh, the amount of volume for buildings. Is that just your choice uh, or it's based on uh, an analysis of the urban situation, the job situation, the, uh, the requirement for dwellings or is more just uh, an option that you took to verify some uh, uh, other issues, let's say, more uh, connections, uh, livability, symbolic values, and so on, or you base your project on uh, figures, like quantitative figures, taken from some kind of statistics or uh, urban uh, plans already in uh, already there. Right. So, uh, thank you for your question. So I sort of took a temperature of San Diego's economy and I kind of looked at how the job market was growing over the last few years. For instance, is the life sciences businesses, right? And I sort of projected in the next few years that this um, site is gonna be able to handle um, the large square footage of um, life sciences of spaces, about 7.2 million square feet. And all of that would, um, and for regular offices, which is about 2 million square feet, so assuming that all of that would um, you know, invite about 30,000 employees over the next few years. And then I was able to use that to you know, propose um, 4,000 residential units for, for the site. So I, I use that metric to- research. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Whoever screen sharing, the screen went to black. But we saw Toji's board for a second. So. Yeah, can you put back the plans? I think Brian might be trying to pull it up, um, Toji, unless you have it um, readily available. Unfortunately, the board is is way too large as a document. It is, it, it will crash the system. So we can see it, I'll make it larger here, but we can't do full screen. Give me a second. Give it a second to load. So I had a, so I had to just jump in since they were kind of quiet for a bit. Um, I have a similar question about how you determine the programming of, of the of the site. So it was good to hear that you, you know you took this position. Oh well, you basically projected the emergence of the city, and then 
created this, I, I don't wanna say field condition, but this condition around, around an airport. Um, it still doesn't speak to like any quantitative information. And I'm really concerned about like the qualitative one of, you know, having residential so close to the, the, uh, the terminal, the airstrip. So like a place, it sounds like, a, are you, you have familiarity with San Diego? A little bit, yeah. Yeah, so, so I, you know, I've been in San Diego, so, but even if you go a little further up north, so a place like Inglewood, where they're right next to the airport, like there are, <laughs> the, the, the residences that's lived in Inglewood since for most of their life, used to it a little bit, but all the new, newer residences are really bothered by the sounds of the <laughs> airplane so, so close above. Uh, so that's one concern that I would have. Uh, the other thing that I'm really interested in is you've, you've almost turned the, like the programmatic relationships of the terminal, let's say like the, the retail and everything else, like outside to this more public space realm. But then I'm wondering what happens then on the inside, right? There's a reason why all of those things are there. And are you, are you considering that in the design? Are you saying, look, that's no longer needed? Because there's an entire like uh, critical discourse on that, right? On on the market economy within the airport terminal itself. And then if I'm flipping that inside out, like is it like what does that do to the inside of the of the airport? Again, so this this can sort of serve as you know something in conjunction with the airport, sort of like an extension of the airport. That's kind of how I I'm look at it. And it could also be, you know, not just a um, you know, an innovation campus, but also a destination, right? So I don't think this would, you know, nullify whatever has been there in the past. And then um, to your question about the noise in, in the area, so I've sort of gone through some, you know, great extents to mitigate the amount of noise that would be experienced within the space. So first of all, there's a requirement which there's a noise requirement for, for the airport, which I sort of spoke about earlier. Um, residences cannot be located within, you know, like a 75 decibel noise range. And I took that, I took that measure and didn't put any um, residential units within that space. Also the solar panels not only act as, um, you know, a source of power for the site, but in some instances, they would also act as of refractors for the noise coming from the runway. So that sort of mitigates the noise and, you know, can make this a more comfortable, you know, environment for, for the users. Okay, so I, let me just respond to one, one thing that you said. You said that you don't think that kind of inverting, let's say, the retail in the market to the airport doesn't have much of an impact. Am I correct? So I can't say that again. So, yeah, it's, you know, it might be on my end, like my thing is muffled. You're saying that you don't think that the, that inverting the retail and market of the airport has any any effect? I don't think it would. I sort of see it as an extension of of that of the airport. That's that's what I said. So so I'll use the example of just of water, right? So if I go to uh -huh. the airport, I have a bottle of water. I have to dump it before I. As soon as I get to security, I have to get rid of my water. I'm still thirsty now. I have to buy an eight dollar bottle of water, right? So. That, but that's the thing is is that there's a market that I that I that I am that I have to deal with when, once I'm inside that they take advantage of. That's why the bottle of water is eight dollars, right? So now you you flip that, and I think but and that's where the comment like that's part of the conversation that I would have had is 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 flipping that and what does that do? Um, there's also the potential of does my while I'm inside do I see what's out there? like there's also security procession through the project. Um, how you handle that becomes really really key and critical. Um, there's also a conversation of like the society, like society of the spectacle. Uh, and like now as, as I, cause I think about mobility and if I was in Seoul and one of the first things I know is like Seoul has free high speed internet, it's absolutely amazing. And when you get on the train, the train will be packed but everybody's on their phone. When you get to the airport, the airport's packed but everybody's on the phone. And I'm starting to see that, I see that a lot more and more and more. So is there is there like a, this discourse around that? And, and then if you're saying, oh, well, I'm nullifying a lot of that spectacle that used to be in the airport, because it used to be, I don't even see people watching the TV screens in the airport anymore. Everybody's on their phone. So like there's a whole thing with just, for me, just flip inversing the market, that there's a whole conversation on 
mobility. There's a whole conversation again on all these other aspects that I, that I just think, you know, maybe if you had a little bit more time, uh, cause I know you only had one semester to do this intense project, but I would have loved to hear that, that political stance on some of these also like the social and qualitative uh, uh, things around it. But on, this is Kevin, on that, on that point, Tochi, I don't think you really cross over the secure airport zone until you go under the runways and emerge on the other side. Is that correct? Because your, your satellite terminal is, is private air terminal. Is that right? Yes, it is. And that would, you know, having, there's also access through you know, the underground on the train station. To, to the project. But I guess that, you know, on the program, on the retail program and another conversation that when Corey was uh, mentioning that it popped into my mind is you've got the continuation of the Liberty Station historic uh, renovation buildings that most likely you said would probably be retail, but then you've got that kind of retail hub um, in your dome form, right? Or, or in the center of your, your project. And maybe there, maybe those are two different retail experiences. I, do you have any thoughts on kind of how those either work together, complement each other or, or um, are independent of each other in some ways? Yes, yeah, so um, I sort of saw them as, you know, different kinds of retail where the one, you know, uh, sort of the, the, the extension of Liberty Station so, sort of served to, um, you know, artists and, farmer's market type of, that kind of thing. And then where at the center sort of served towards, um, you know, food and beverage, um, et cetera. And then, you know, with the technology displays also in the center um, of, of the project. I think what, what Corey brought up is important though, because that, that secure line, because there's lots of conversation lately about remote check-in at a lot of airports to address the issue of, of uh, congestion and, and, and the time it takes to get through security and things like that. So, you know, if you had a, more time to think of to think about it, it'd be interesting to understand that, that kind of security protocols, if you arrive at Grand Central Terminal, is there a secure check-in that happens there and you bypass your development and you go straight to the airport? Or, or is there a mixing that happens that then becomes potentially problematic because you have secure and unsecure uh, populations, you know, somehow transversing through your your, your uh, intermodal node where you connect from different transit types. Um, it's a pretty complex question. I don't have an answer to it, but I think it's a good point. Well, in that regard, I mean, I can imagine a development like this tied to an airport that, uh, you know, similar to the way many, uh, you know, New York City or Philadelphia uh, subway systems at the turn of the last century, you would go down to the basement level of your office building and there would be a subway stop right there that you could just go right into so that the employees could come and just get off that stop and go up into their Facility. I could imagine a closed loop here of a kind of subway or a you know, mixed above ground, below ground system where each of these life sciences or scientific research facilities could have their own security that would allow someone to just come right from the airport, get in, check into their lab, do their work, spend their 24, 36 hours, and then get back to the airport and off to the next facility. But to me, there's a real opportunity to think about the new kinds of development that we can use with modern technologies and modern transportation that we could go back to some of the things that were tried a century ago when you know, some of the, the first uh, subway systems connected to large office buildings. I think today I live here in Raleigh, North Carolina. We have the research triangle. and Most of these people just land at the airport, get in their Uber or get in their corporate uh, van transportation system, go right to their facility, do their work, and then boom, they bounce right back out. So I, I would have looked for something a, a little more, 
know, we call avant-garde is really going back to, yeah. you know, the way transportation was dealt with a century ago, but something that's really looking more adventurously to the future to say that these are the kinds of developments that will be tied in. There'll be these semi-private, semi-public things that are tied to the airport authority, but each of the corporations that uses one of these facilities contributes their security back to that. Because that, to me, that's going to be the future. The people are going to be the reason that your initial statistics have said air flight is going up. It's because people are coming in for very short periods of time often, but it's a mission critical thing where it has to be this person in that site. Right? Zoom and technologies we've all found during the pandemic have changed a lot of that, but there's still a tremendous need for actual people and actual places. And I think it's facilities and developments like this that are going to radically change that where you're you're not really going into the city proper. You're just coming for that that one opportunity, that one commercial enterprise that's driving the whole economic engine of this thing. Yeah, to, to that point, one of the things I didn't hear you talk about, Tochi, was that this notion of the satellite terminal was really addressing the future of, um, of drone flight. And so San Diego is either the number two or number three life science cluster in the U.S., depending on what year you look. And the and they've built out essentially all the, the life science clusters in our submarkets. So now they're doing the first major uh, science development downtown. Right now uh, it's in design on the waterfront. And so Tochi's idea was that um, through drone travel to avoid freeways, which San Diego's predominantly a freeway driven city, is that this um, his satellite terminal becomes the connection via personal drone flight to the life science clusters in Torrey Pines and Sorrento Valley. And then they're able to have a, a footprint here and then connect to uh, through the, the major terminal up to the Bay Area or, or Seattle or wherever else the, the life science companies that would locate here have major presence in the US. So uh, I know Tochi had that idea. I didn't hear you describe it much, but, but that was the importance of the how the satellite terminal might function as a, another intermodal uh, transit connection. Yeah, uh, thank you for your comment, Kevin. I, I was trying to sort of, you know, restrict or make my presentation very short, so I miss, I kind of missed some elements. So um, thank you for mentioning that. So it's a, it's a very interesting. I'm, I am struggling. I am just put it out there. Um, honestly, um, it's all the all the carbon footprint that ties to the air travel and other adverse effect that has been brought up in terms of the noise and so on, those chemicals and things that is kind of you know uh, make me uncomfortable to seeing this development. But at the same time, there is this idea that quite, um, you know, in one, one part, I feel like this is like, a, you know, the caught uh, in steroid. So, you know, not just a regular um, transit or, you know, transit oriented, TOD, uh, transit oriented development, but it's like an in, in, um, enhanced, very specialized, high intensity level of transit and, and very, um, again, high density, very specialized development. So um, so I, I, just, I try to step aside and not looking at it as what I know as air travel and what I know as the limitations of airport and the elements that goes in, but it's more of the futuristic, what can be done, just like very specialized, the uh, you know the research hub, in the localized, very specialized way of more you know transportation mode. So the security and different um, the movement within the system and more globally, how does that can work? And not just looking at um, just the typical commercial aircraft, but it is you know something like you know we've seen. Um, all electric commercial air flight has successfully did a test, you know, test flight. So, you know, something like, um, you know, completely dreaming something that we haven't seen. Um, and what does that 
may look like in this kind of development. So I, I'm um, a little bit struggling to understand the, the reality that or some of those outdated thoughts that um, my vision is limited to. Uh, but I want to see a little more futuristic and the potentials that um, what was inspired and how do you see this is more of, you know, the different kind of um, solving the future in terms of um, how this type of carbon intensity can be mitigated and how this can be more of the, um, the way of, um, you know, serving specific needs and use of the development. That is kind of the one thought. Um, and the other one is more tangible level. It would be really, really interesting to actually follow through different type of occupants. How would they um, transverse or travel um, between the securities and different um, um, the program elements within the development. So if you're the researcher uh, who is visiting versus if you're a resident who has an assignment of maybe you know the year long project or you are more of the permanent. So what would that be look different in their perspective? How does that going to um, impact in their the movement in the diagram? What would be your thoughts on how you can see this, um, the different demographics and different occupants actually um, coexisting in this facility? Yeah, um, thank you for your question. So to your point about um, the carbon emissions and you know, how that would affect the development, I feel like in the next few you know, decades or whenever um, you know, electric flight has become ubiquitous, I feel like that wouldn't change the dynamic of this of this project, you know, and it kind of also sort of addresses, um, you know, carbon emissions to an extent because currently in San Diego you have about ninety percent of the trips to the airport, you know, via cars, which isn't which isn't great. So you know, if a huge percentage of the users of the airport lived just five minutes away from it and were able to, you know, get access through um, an underground train. I feel like that could be um, a great solution to, to that problem. And then about um, you know the occupants and the users here. So this this is mostly geared towards um, life sciences and biotechnology research. And those users have uh, you know for instance the the four buildings surrounding the the central terminal. They have access directly from the train station underground to you know to like a sky lobby before getting into their their labs and all that, you know, um, other um, other spaces in, in the project. So they have direct access while um, other users who would want to go to more public spaces like retail and their, you know, residences, which are um, west of the, of the center, they would get to the surface level and, you know, travel by a, a um, people mover, um, a surface people mover going around the entire development, going, um, north also to um, the retail and you know, to the residential district on, on the project. I mean, considering the architectural vision that you have, seems to me that you, I see many nice, interesting ideas in terms of uh, relationship between uh, the park, the, the main square, let's put it this way, with the monumental central piece and the connections. At the same time, it feels that uh, there is a certain uniformity that is going through the entire site that uh, it makes it more looking like an office park uh, where uh, you find comfortable office space, very transparent, very with a lot of light, interesting roofscape with gardens and so on, but it gives the sensation of a, a sort of a professional place. Uh, I mean, maybe the uh, some detailing uh, by further developing the project could uh, give the a sense of livability, which is a little 
beyond, going a little beyond uh, this uh, uh, stark image of glass and light. Um, on the other side, the plan, it's, it's clean in many ways. I think uh, uh, it gives the sensation of a citadel, let's say, within this uh, uh, ur suburban no-scape, you know, this uh, no-place that is around the airport. Somehow you, you establish a, a name for this area. Um, but I would try to even go down a little bit more into the streets and the squares and give a sense of uh, differentiations maybe so that the, the place, it doesn't look just like a, a uniform, homogeneous kind of idea uh, for everything. Um, you know, maybe the street uh, could end up into something that is not just uh, uh, nowhere, you know, the, some axes are really going towards the, I don't know, the, the cityscape, but not very clear about that. Another thing is, like you say, there are some historic buildings there. And I think the idea could be interesting with this sort of Central Park. Uh, to make them uh, uh, somehow visible and appreciable, but uh, we don't see them. We don't know exactly uh, what they look like and if they deserve uh, that uh, position so clear and so strong. So I, I, I have uh, uh, some very good uh, impressions about your uh, uh, renderings and the feelings of openness and lightness. But I agree, I think uh, maybe the, the subject could have given you the courage to do something uh, that goes a little bit beyond uh, the uh, harmonious expectation that you give us. Uh, you know, I'm not saying to do Zaha did uh, or uh, even the TWA terminal so that you are near the airport, you, you metaphorically, you interpret the flight yeah, with the strange shapes and dynamic uh, elements and so on. But uh, something in between maybe, something that really give the sensation that you did something for the people flying or at least something that has to do with this idea of being beyond the land on, on the hair and something a little bit more courageous in that direction. Yeah. Andrea, I wonder, you know, as you're as you were talking about that, and you were mentioning the sort of glassiness and the and the sort of corporate nature of this thing. Yeah. I got to thinking of I, I haven't spent a lot of time in San Diego because I'm I'm deathly afraid of San Diego. I'm afraid if I moved there, I just I would uh, uh, buy a sailboat and have a surfboard and a, <laughs> and a big dog and do nothing for the rest of my life. The benign nature of the climate there is something that really is quite remarkable. And I wonder if that might, you know, so just in Tochi's defense, um, Tochi had intended to go to San Diego, but something got in the way called COVID. Um, and that made it kind of impossible to do that. So getting that sense of the, of the, of the potential of the climate of that particular place in the world was not really an option. Um, to do firsthand. And I think had, had Tochi, had you gotten there and had you had that same feeling that I had my first day off the airplane and walking uh, out of San Diego airport going, if the sun sets on me while I'm here in San Diego, I'll never leave because the climate's so wonderful and benign, uh, that it might've have, might have, might have challenged the assumption of the, of the articulation of the character of this. And it might've then prompted some of those issues that that we saw uh, that, that were brought up regarding the, the sustainability issues regarding this place. Hmm. I, don't, uh, I don't mean that to stifle conversation. I mean, keep, keep going folks. I, it just prompted one of those, one of those mo rare moments where my brain worked. <laughs> Can I jump in just very quickly on the character issue? Uh, absolutely, this is in San Diego. But it's connected to the rest of the country and it's connected to the rest of the world. And I'm thinking about, uh, as a precedent, the um, new city uh, connected to the um, airport outside Seoul. And there, uh, the architects made a 
a big attempt to make an international place. Uh, and I wonder if there's some way that you can build upon the, um, uh, you know, the character of this place that's a portal to elsewhere. And, uh, you know, perhaps use that as a, um, oh, I guess an imaginative possibility for uh, what it could be like to uh, live and work in this Aerotropolis. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like this sort of lent itself to, you know, explore a lot of ideas where it's, like you said, it's sort of a portal into um, the country. But like, I I had to streamline my, uh, my thought process to, you know, sort of deliver the project in, in due time. So that that's definitely a good um, a good point to you know to explore. Thank you for that comment. Hey Toshi, can I ask a question? Um, Absolutely. Did you look at um, some of the HQ2 Amazon proposals that um, was on the news recently uh, as they were sort of looking for a second footprint out of, outside of Seattle? Because I think one of the sort of points of their RFP, their request for proposal was to be as close to an airport as much as possible. And you could kind of see the entries that came from the different states and jurisdictions. They were sort of like building developments similar to this adjacent to airports as proposal for them. Um, you know, my sort of concern with your title as this being an aerotropolis is something that will be serving or they're supposed to serve a large community and variety of, of, of people and occupations and whatnot. Um, and I want you to sort of maybe address it if it is a concern for you that a master plan like this would be quite inviting to a mega company like an Apple or an Amazon that goes, I want my employees near the airport. I want to be able to sort of come in and come out. You know, Cause you were mentioning sort of like this bio life sciences um, bent or slant to the project. Um, were you maybe looking to plugging a little bit of diversity, not only in terms of the programmatic element but actually in how you lay them out. So it doesn't read like a corporate park that could accommodate you know, smaller businesses and not like giant corporate entities like an Amazon or whatnot. Because I think they made a very good point as to this maybe having a slight impression of looking like an office park, which, you know, I guarantee you if there's any company out there that's looking to move to like, for example, San Diego, when they see your plan, Apple is going to go, I could fit 10,000 employees here. They're going to be sort of like a captured audience let's buy up the whole property. And it doesn't allow for that diversification that makes a metropolis or an air, aerotropolis. So I wonder if you thought about that. Um, yes, yeah, that's actually, that, that is a great point. So, um, you know, uh, one thing about San Diego is there's a huge um, market for, um, you know, startups. There's a lot of startups coming up in San Diego, a lot of them. And I thought about that in the sense that I made um, spaces for incubators accelerated spaces and co-working spaces that serve to, you know, smaller, you know, businesses that are starting up. And I, I tried to address that and, you know, design this such a way that they could actually grow. The, the spaces allow them to grow as their firm or their company grows bigger. So I do have um, some incubator spaces in the, in the building that um, lends itself to small businesses. And, you know, that gives them the ability to work in this environment with um, other bigger, you know, sort of corporations, and it allows for um, collaboration and um, all, all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I, I did think about that. It doesn't serve just the uh, huge corporations. It could also it lends itself also to um, smaller businesses just starting up. I, you know, Tochi, one thought I'd add to that, and I wish you would have shown the diagram, but uh, just northwest of this site is uh, over 1300 acres in what's called the Midway Pacific Community Plan. That community plan was just updated and the voters in San Diego just in November voted to raise the height limit over the 30 foot limit enacted by the Coastal Act back in the 70s. So this site could really be a catalyst for redevelopment of a few of the surrounding neighborhoods that have significant amount of density that this site could provide you know, a great hub and support for, for business use and other uses for, and, and your 
urban diagrams didn't zoom out far enough to show that connectivity that I think that would have been helpful. Well, it looks, looks like, I'm not sure if I have sound on here. Looks like we're winding down here a bit. This will give us an opportunity to take a break between sessions. I'm gonna turn over to um, Jamie Tillman, who was the chair of this committee to wrap things up and then we'll have time for a little five minute break. Great, thank you, Brian. And, and thank you everybody for being here. Um, Tochi, there, there are uh, a lot of things to say about this process, but um, what I'd like to do is, is thank you for taking this particular challenge on. Um, th this challenge requires um, a, a strong beating heart, um, a, an, an eye to, to creating uh, and bringing together all of these um, different populations and elements on one place. So, uh, you know, th the process of selecting the site uh, was, was pretty exhaustive and took, took quite a while to, to kind of settle into place. But I think in the end, you selected absolutely the best possible site for exploring these, these um, issues and your thesis proposition. Um, you know, the, the Aerotropolis is, is, is a concept that, that I think um, in the best sense of it uh, has a sense of new possibilities. It is about new modes of interaction. It's driven by a new proximity of research, production, and global connectivity. And I think the, the area where you can, you can benefit the most by developing this is really thinking about um, the, the vision for, for bringing all of these elements together. And, and the sense of that is, is sort of a sense of unleashing a certain type of energy that is infinitely creative. Um, one of the uh, comments that I really appreciated um, uh, was, was from Andrea, um, uh, goes beyond, you know, the sort of the, the vision thing, this idea that, quote, you're going beyond harmonious expectations, your need to go beyond harmonious expectations to, to posit new modes of interaction. And I think that's the promise of this project um, I think you've brought all the ingredients here, um, and, and I think you can go forward and, and explore and develop this project um, and, and carry it with you um, as, as, a, as the starting point of, of a uh, very forward-looking, uh, future-oriented um, investigation of bringing uh, expertise uh, commercial enterprise and global connectivity, transportation connected connectivity into one place. So, I commend you on that. It's it's been it's been uh, a lot of fun working with you this semester, and uh, thank you um, for for all of this time. And thank you thank you to all of the uh, members of the jury for joining us here today. Thank you, Jamie. And uh, just to frame this, uh, Tochi is doing a dual degree in architecture and real estate development. Uh, two of his other committee members, Tanya Bansal and Maria Day uh, uh, Marshall, uh, were also on the committee along with Jamie and myself. We're going to take a, a little break here, give us a chance to uh, stand up, stretch our legs, be a little healthy, move around, get a cup of coffee. We'll be back at the top of the hour. And uh, we'll conclude this afternoon's activities with yet another urban project, this time in Pittsburgh. Ian's going to show up there. See you in a few minutes. Bye, everyone.
Ciao, sono in intervallo. Eh, fino ad ora...
Hello, Professor Bell. Mr. Heinley, I'd know that voice anywhere. Can you see my face on the screen? Yes, I can see you. Ciao, Architecto Ponzi, come stai. You're muted there. Non, non, non ci senti. Just to remind everybody that we are live on Facebook, YouTube, and Panopto. So just want to, you can keep talking, but. Okay. <laughs> hey, Perry, anyway, good, good to see you, Matt. Good to see you, Matt. Good to be seen these days. Yes, yes. And Michelle, but I see only picture of Michelle Lapracos. Ciao, Andrea. Oh, okay, ciao, ciao. <laughs> see you too. Ti ho, ho inviato un email. Sì, ho visto, infatti, oh, ho visto sì. appena ora. Sì. Good. You all look good. <laughs> are you ready? It's funny how COVID has united us all on Zoom, hasn't it? Yeah, it's true. Weird. Ready when you are, BK. Just about. I didn't want to stop everybody from talking, but I just wanted to make sure everybody knew that you were going out there to the real world. Mm. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, this is the final presentation this afternoon. Uh, Paris Sim will be taking us to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where he's going to be looking at some waterfront development between two ballparks and a freeway and a bridgehead. And he's going to be suggesting different ways to look at the site. So Paris, this is all yours, by the way. Paris is a dual degree uh, architecture and real estate development candidate. Uh, his committee was Matt Bell, myself, Maria de Marshall, and Tanya Bansal, and Paris, the show is all yours. Hello, everybody. My name is Paris, and this is Embracing Disruption urban streets and infrastructure of the 21st century. Before I begin, I'd like to say big thanks to the committee members. Uh, this has been truly a team effort from the beginning till today. So thank you to everybody in the committee. The presentation will begin with the thesis proposition, then urban streets and highways, looking at the big 21st century changes, then to the site, and finally, the proposed vision of master plan urban design. So how will urban highways and streets look in the next few decades amid the big changes of the 21st century? Could they begin to transform from today's thoroughfare for vehicles to tomorrow's vibrant and flexible spaces for living, working, and playing? So urban streets used to look more like this. Uh, this is a photograph of Mulberry Street in New York City in 1900. Um, as you can see, this is full of life. The retail program on the ground floor spilling out the street and it's surprisingly multimodal. But the same street looks more like this today. Uh, it's overrun by personal vehicles and people are pushed aside, uh, giving very few spaces for um, walking. And bikers in urban areas often find themselves sharing the road with the vehicles uh, and, and causing some safety issues for both the riders and, biker, uh, and, and drivers. With the invention of cars, uh, it also influenced a, a bigger uh, infrastructural change in a bigger scale. Um, so the construction of interstate highways in the 1950s and 60s connected cities across the country, but also separated uh, communities within. Uh, in some extreme cases, a few neighborhoods were completely isolated by this infrastructure and resulted in, in poverty, segregation, um, and, and devalue of of real estate and that's continued to happen today. And these are clearly visible from the, the area perspective that the construction highway completely disrupted the city grid line. So it's the uh, case in the, in the Baltimore, Maryland, the construction of the Eastern and Western highway going north and south, uh, separated downtown area to the surrounding communities. Um, same case for the Oakland, California and Pittsburgh. Uh, Pittsburgh's unique uh, geography had this two grid system that knitted together very nicely. But again, the construction of the highway completely destroyed that connection and separated downtown area to the eastern uh, community. 
So what are the big changes of the 21st century that will influence how we design streets in the future and reimagine urban highways uh, in, our, in our cities? So we can look at them into four big themes. So first, looking at the autonomous mobility. Second, public health challenges. Third, demographic shift. And finally, new consumer habit. The autonomous mobility, um, the autonomous vehicles are already here roaming around in our cities today. Um, that gives an opportunity to regain back those lost pedestrian passage for the people. And it also gives you more opportunity to redesign the streetscape to accommodate these new technologies, providing more spaces for drop-off and pickup zones, more space for transit to arrive, um, and perhaps less space for parking lots in urban areas. And this can all tie back into this uh, digital infrastructure and providing a, a more a truly a multimodal uh, system that again ties back into the a massive transit uh, in cities. But this ownership of autonomous vehicles has to be seriously considered by the city officials and perhaps come up with some uh, policies for ownership uh, that limits the personal uh, cars or personal autonomous cars in cities. Um, as you can see from these diagrams, if we were to own these autonomous vehicles just like we're owning cars today, it wouldn't change anything from the street, perhaps make it even worse in the future. Second, uh, public health challenges. Um, obviously the COVID-19 has been a big struggle for us this year. And the reason why we're on, in the online environment today, um, but it's forcing us to rethink about urban streets uh, as a place uh, for activity and safe place for social distancing. Uh, with the autonomous vehicles in the future, we can regain again back the street for the people and perhaps use that space uh, to have more flexibility in the street, more programs coming out to the street, and maybe more space for green infrastructure to provide a street as an important health uh, benefit for the city uh, residents. And again, uh, it's inevitable that we might face another pandemic like this in the future. So can we start to design our streets uh, to accommodate these flexible programs in the future and be uh, transformative and adaptable? Third, uh, demographic shift um, has been uh, obvious from the 1800s that we are gaining lots more urban populations uh, in the United States uh, compared to the urban areas. And recently the uh, urban residents are getting uh, more educated, getting smarter, um, and they prefer this proximity to urban amenities, uh, and it's all about convenience for them. And lastly, uh, new consumer habit. Uh, E-commerce has been a big portion of our lives uh, today, but the whole shipping uh, process uh, is proven to be very expensive and ineffective, especially the last mile logistics, where uh, it gets right before to your doorsteps has been about 53% of the entire shipping cost um, and, and takes most time um, for the industry. So they're rethinking about how that can be changed with the autonomous mobility. Um, so then can streets provide a safe uh, areas or system for, for these to um, be have in, in the future. But that puts, more tra that puts more pressure on brick and mortar stores in urban areas um, as e-commerce penetration has been increasing uh, from 2000. And with the COVID-19, it only exaggerated that growth um, in the future. So can good street design uh, provide new and safe experience for physical space uh, to capture the foot traffic and increase the uh, real estate value for this physical space in urban areas? So with those in mind, uh, we'll dive into a site proposed uh, in Pittsburgh. Uh, Pittsburgh is an important uh, city that links between the uh, big East Coast cities to Midwest, uh, like Chicago. And the Pittsburgh itself uh, is well connected throughout locally and regionally with abundance of bus routes uh, uh, and the right rail connecting uh, downtown directly uh, into the, uh, from, from the regional uh, context. The city itself is also rethinking about their entire infrastructure uh, for the future of their city. So this is 2070 mobility plan where they're starting to identify some intermodal hubs in the city with 
proposed a new mobility system like the aerial rapid transit and at grade rapid system, uh, transit that connects both locally uh, and regionally. And that's all really important because uh, Pittsburgh is re experiencing this resurgence of population um, with this robust industrial institutions and healthcare services. Uh, their economy has been booming since the recession, which has been fueled by the technology and robotics industry that's been emerging from, from the city. And uh, Pittsburgh, the icon of the Rust Belt uh, in the 1950s, uh, is turning into a smart belt with this robust economy of technology and, and robotics. We dive in close into the core of downtown area. Uh, as you can see, the urban highway system completely isolates the downtown area and even separates, to, separates from the surrounding communities. But the daily traffic numbers in the core uh, system of these highways is significantly lower than the surrounding highway system. Uh, it's ranging from 20,000 to 28,000 per day. We can compare that to the numbers in Massachusetts Avenue in, in DC. Uh, in the Mass Avenue, the average daily uh, traffic is 45,000 compared to 28,000 in the raised highway in Pittsburgh. But the Mass Avenue creates an economy. There's a revenue uh, from the retail stores and it creates a place, a streetscape uh, that people can walk compared to the, the, the highways that are completely separating uh, the North Shore, which is the uh, space between those two stadiums to the north side, to the left of the highway. So can we begin to reimagine uh, the portion of the highway uh, and begin to expand the downtown area over the river uh, that connects to North Shore and even reach to North Side beyond the highway. So the vision of the existing site, the North, side, uh, North Shore um, has a great amenities, like the two major stadiums with the metro station right being in the middle and just to North, a multi uh, mixed use program with Nova Place, even to the general hospital above. The six through seven, six through ninth bridge uh, that connects directly to the downtown area. But as you can see, the Fort Duquesne bridge uh, raised above with double decker um, completely separates separates the site into two and creates a very unpleasant, uh, unpleasant experience for the pedestrians on grade. And also the values of real estate of the really important site in Pittsburgh. So we can begin to uh, reimagine the urban highways in big three phases. We can begin to reduce the urban vehicle density on the top deck of the bridge and slowly transform that into a new bridge that comes down on grade and connects directly to the downtown area and unlocking uh, a great deal of real estate on site for future development. And lastly, we replace the wall of highways above to an urban boulevard similar to Mass Avenue that connects to the grade level and relinks to the strict grid uh, that used to be there before. So again, the first phase of reducing big density to transforming the bridge that comes down to the, uh, the center of the site and transforming the highway into an urban boulevard that again connects back to the strict grid and, and unlocking the real estate uh, that could be developed in the future. So the urban condition today uh, is pretty dreadful. Um, lack of mobility, uh, lack of health and sustainability um, there are two stadiums, but not being fully capitalized. Um, and the streets are uh, unwalkable uh, with these parking lots uh, and only active when, the, when there are game days on the stadiums. And this is what we're um, proposed for a new urban design between the two stadiums for the future. A fully multimodal, um, walkable community, robust green infrastructure, flexible street that can all accommodate uh, diverse programs in the building on the street. And looking at the site from the above today, uh, and this is what's proposed as a full vision, with a very strong spine that connects the water to the uh, southwest, to the uh, connection to northeast, uh, to the above the north side, 
and the, the shared street or shared space can really accommodate these flexible programs uh, for the future and accommodate these new mobilities uh, of the future. Again, the comparison of side by side of the proposed urban design that will um, begin to have the four big changes that are happening today into uh, fully realization. Looking to 3D context, again, the Ford camper is coming down on grade, meeting the central space uh, in the urban design. And this can all happen through a strategic development strategy. First, we want to activate the North Shore uh, at the corner of PNC Park, which is a baseball stadium there, with the first phase of demolition uh, of the ramp uh, that goes above. Phase two, uh, or idea two, that we create a strong core that we bring down the bridge uh, and fully capitalize on the metro station uh, on, on grade. Third, uh, we connect to the surroundings. So the football stadium to the west um, gets new face of programs with a big plaza that opens up to the water. And to the east above the baseball stadium, we change the axis so we uh, connect directly to the north side of Pittsburgh. And lastly, with the new urban boulevard, we establish new streetscape that can generate economy. Uh, and provide a street scape that people can walk on and connect to the existing street grid. And this will be the future of North Shore with the full uh, development. And it's really the idea that uh, the North Shore is an important crossroad between these four important places. So that downtown to the south, north side to the uh, uh, north, and really connecting the natural uh, environment of the water to the east with the Heinz Plaza, uh, to get the mixed use program uh, with the Nova and the hospital above. And some uh, very anchored uh, programs that centers the growth of the, the district. And the program also influenced by the uh, transit hub being the anchor uh, at the center of the site, flanked by the two big stadiums, and really creating this into a, a vibrant and, and um, mixed use district that can be lively 24 seven instead of few days, few days a year uh, for, for game days. We're creating uh, beautiful places uh, that has a special functions and, and adaptability. So North Shore landing in the middle, uh, the bridge comes down and provides that multimodal hub uh, on grade that connects to the mass transit. To the west, Heinz Plaza uh, is a big space that can accommodate tailgates. Uh, it's a big culture for football games. Uh, and PNC Park uh, Plaza next to the baseball stadium can capture uh, baseball fans before and after the game. And we're proposing a, a new bus route throughout the site to really connect the city to the uh, city uh, and, and regional context. We begin to have a strategic mobility strategy. So distinguishing between the pedestrian streets, uh, new shared street and slow traffic streets and a new urban boulevard on the north. So we are proposing uh, street topologies, uh, first looking at the pedestrian only street. A neighborhood feel like streetscape. Uh, slow traffic street will accommodate a few traffic, but ground for retail and urban housing above. The urban boulevard, uh, again, transforms that uh, highway structure into a uh, urban boulevard that creates economy, streetscape, and connects back to the on-grade uh, central space by the metro station. And the new shared space, uh, instead of a street, uh, we believe that this could be a, a vibrant space that can accommodate all these new mobilities, but also experience for people. And robust uh, green infrastructure on the ground with the perhaps underground logistic system that can connect between the buildings. And it's a big comparison between how it can be, how it's designed today and how it can be designed tomorrow with emphasis on people, again, robust green infrastructure, no underground parking space perhaps, and that can be reinvested into urban density in the future. It can be flexible and transformative. Um, and then the, the, the infrastructure will support all these different 
programs, typical day, uh, to game day, maybe closing down some street, and uh, really it's overrun by people going into the stadium. And especially if events can start to happen and that can connect directly into the ground floor program. So then the indoor and outdoor uh, become seamless uh, at some points uh, through these programs and with this new infrastructure. Um, so the, the view of the new train station uh, that looks down at the main street. This is the, uh, the opposite side looking into the baseball stadium and the new plaza that's created to capture people going into the baseball stadium. And this is Heinz Plaza uh, that can accommodate uh, the tailgates for, for game days, but also with a retail street that can capture people 24-7, 365 days a week, uh, year. So in conclusion, uh, the thesis really is an exploration of how these four big changes can influence the design of the street and also in design of an urban uh, place. In this case, it's a model for a case study in Pittsburgh and growing cities that they can begin to reimagine streets and urban highways into something more valuable uh, for the future. Uh, so they can create a, a healthier, vibrant space um, and reconnect those places that was once disconnected. And, and of course, we are designing good street. Uh, and perhaps the, the photographs we started off in the beginning of the slide uh, tells us a lot more story than uh, it does. And maybe it's taking us about 100 years now to realize that good street can be multimodal and fully social and safe, and it can begin to uh, help grow the city in the future and the prosperity uh, of, of a district and, and growing cities uh, like Pittsburgh. Uh, so with that, I'd like to open up for questions and discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Paris. And as Paris said, uh, we're ready now for comments, questions, critique. Hmm. Should I share my screen to show the board? Or okay. you can show the board. That would be very nice, Paris. Just for one second. I, I, I assume maybe I didn't get the, the introduction very clearly, but uh, uh, this plan uh, assumes that uh, there won't be the need for those freeways anymore in the future because the technologies change, because the smart working, because, uh, you know, for many other reasons. I mean, that probably you you don't have to take into consider to consider to consideration too much because it's a matter of uh, technical statistical issues and so on. But I assume that that is your starting point. Is that right? Or yeah, that's correct. Um, some of the beginning slides that showed the numbers of traffic that's on there today, um, they're significantly lower than the major highways that's going through North and South. Okay. Uh, and they're they're deteriorating. They're they're reaching about their 70 year lifespan. Uh, so they need reinvestment to make sure that they're safe. Um, but we're calling that that investment should be uh, placed in a different way than fixing them uh, and then replacing them for the future, for something like urban boulevard uh, and maybe reconnecting the bridge down to the uh, to the district, so they mm -hmm. can generate economy and, uh, and better connection in the future. And on top of that, the autonomous vehicle technology will make sure that the driving on highways would be more efficient. So we wouldn't need uh, a much more complex urban highway system like we do today in urban areas. No, because uh, I mean, this is clearly the, the, the best uh, thinking way, you know, that the future would be more humanized. Uh, otherwise, you know, the alternative could be just to take those freeway and just put them underground, for example. Uh, like they have done in many cases, like for example, in San Francisco, uh, in, you know, be, it's not a freeway, but you know, uh, they, they cover it uh, with a park, uh, you know, before going to the Golden Gate Bridge. Yeah. Um, but, but I mean, that clarify, I think your plan is very 
very interesting and very beautiful in many ways. You know, you uh, you you recreate a a, a very urban and uh, comfortable looking space with this uh, main street, uh, you know, surrounded by potential good architecture. Of course, you didn't go into that, but that's 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 very good. And the fact that you have two stadium that they assume the, the role of monuments in this case, uh, I think it's something that you have to also to consider in a, in a, in a very uh, more uh, maybe design way. Um, I think your rendering somehow are, are quite interesting and, and uh, uh, in, in, they're going in that direction. Um, I think, uh, you know, maybe on the level of uh, traffic, maybe the, you could have done a little bit more studies, for example, about what is one-way street, two-way streets, how we can uh, avoid larger streets by using uh, a different circulatory system. For example, Peter Calthorp has done several studies about this uh, uh, issues, you know, applied to Chinese and new towns, but uh, clearly they can be also applied to uh, uh, American towns, uh, you know, by reducing the, the size of the lanes and, but ba basically by directing cars into different direction to reduce the amount of uh, street uh, uh, for cars. It's, uh, 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 I don't know if you are aware of those type of studies, but I, I suggest you to look into that Peter Kalsor, um, uh urban street mm -hmm. scape. I, I don't remember exactly the, the name of the book, but, uh, but that's the thing. Uh, otherwise, I feel, uh, I feel it's a good plan. I feel uh, uh, maybe the idea of just uh, putting all the residential on the upper part, if I understand it that way, and creating this commercial, uh, leisurable street, main street, without uh, uh, indicating that even residents could be there, or maybe there is, but I'm not. I'm not sure that I understand that. You see, I, I think the zoning could be not so strongly defined uh, unless you want to have a sort of a suburb uh, situation with the, uh, the, the house, with the garden around, uh, two floors. But that, that's not, I think, is the case here. It seems like you are more like raw housing on the top part of the site. I think a mixed use, in, even in the main street, could be could be an interesting approach, but overall, I think you did a very good job. It's very very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, uh, just going back to the mobility uh, strategy and how we can kind of divert some of the traffic's in the site. Um, there are existing um, infrastructure, meaning the streets that's already there that we're keeping it. Um, yeah. So you can see a street that runs through the uh, western side of the football stadium down to the river. Um, so we wanted to kind of divert some of those more bigger traffic like trucks and, and, and vans towards that uh, outer site uh, with the new boulevard on, to the north that can carry those heavy traffic. But within the community, we're um, proposing a slow traffic that only is one way from both sides or even a one direction um, way that it's, it's very clear that this is a pedestrian priority zoned uh, community and the more faster traffic cars are pushed to the side of the community. Um, and then the programs on the boulevard, uh, the diagram, I think it's maybe a misrepresentation of the program. Uh, we are proposing a row houses that's similar to the scale to the north. And it's also elevated to uh, about 40 to 50 feet in the air. So that low rise uh, row mm -hmm. homes can tie back into the more higher buildings to the main street. It also gives a context that's uh, that's uh, real to Pittsburgh and to the north side of Pittsburgh as well. Yeah, yeah that section would have been would have been great to see that entire site section. See the, the relationships on heights. Um, I was, you know, as as Andrea pointed out, that you you talked about the capacity of the roads. Um, 
I was somewhat skeptical at first, to be honest, because you know, like you showed you showed the, the highway in, in Boston and the relate and like the relationship and the relation between that one and, and, and this. Uh, and you have to believe you said this was like what 20, 23,000 cars per day or something like that. I, I, okay, so I, I can't visualize that, so I don't know how intense <laughs> that that is. So bringing the so but bringing that highway down uh, to the road bifurcates it in another potentially violent way. Uh, but now I understand you're saying that the autonomous vehicle will, will even will make that even less. I just want to make sure I get understand that moving forward. Yeah, so that's the only reason why we think that highways in the future doesn't need to be robust and complex and have maybe five lanes per, per way. Um, and right. also these raised highway today in Pittsburgh are deteriorating, they're reaching their lifespan. So they need so, more- So that's, right, so, so that's where I get greedy and I wanna see some of the approaches that you've made on the street, like how, what happens to the bridge? Right. And does the bridge change? Does, do, does the bridge become this uh, engine of economy as well? Right. Once you those lanes change down, like what's the capacity of the bridge to to hold, you know, pedestrians to go across? Are you able to have informal, uh, again, economies that happen there? What happens when that bridge meets the other side? Because the other side is downtown and there's like two parks on the other side. Correct. Yeah, like what happens there? The other thing that I, I, I don't know Pittsburgh too too well, but I know uh, BRK is doing it, well, was doing a master planning project there. Is this near the, is this near the Hill District? Uh, it's kind of close. If you look at the area view on the right side, uh, that really tall building, the PNC Plaza building, it's right behind that. So it's, it's a bit close, um, but it's, it's, it's distance from that um, project. So there's also, cause it seems that like when I look at this project right beside up on the other side of the Heinz, there is a somewhat of a bifurcation between the, the neighborhood beyond. And, uh, and that's, and that's, I know that that's been a huge criticism with Bjarke's master plan is that it seems to turn its back to the community beyond. So I'd be interested in seeing how you start to address that, right? How do you create more porosity to blend in the communities to get within your project because you've done a fantastic job of, of looking at the street and I love the, the you know the the um, the image the first image that you showed from early New York right where the streets belong to people and not the car and I love the fact that you're going back to that but but with that said I I, I would love to see some sort of I don't know porosity and connective tissue between this and then again the adjacent communities. Yeah, so the, uh, the site, uh, sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. You respond first, then I'll talk. Yeah, I'll be very, very brief. Uh, the community to the uh, west of Heinz Field, uh, it's basically empty parking lots. There's no residential places. Um, it's mostly light industrial park. Uh, and we're, we want to focus on the site being connection through north and south. So the south being the downtown area to the north, um, beyond what used to be a, a wall of highway to the north side neighborhood uh, with this connection that's made uh, throughout the community, but there's a conversation about we had in the late uh, this semester that we should expand our development beyond the Heinz field to make sure that those um, parking lots would be also uh, developed so that there's more porosity and more connection to the perhaps east and west as well. But I think for, for being uh, for today, the development really focused on between the two stadiums and connection through the north and south. You know, it's, it's probably important to point out that <clears throat> Pittsburgh is a city, if you've ever been there, that is defined by topography. Um, it, it is only hills. And he may have found one of the only flat sites in the city between these two ballparks. But the, but the areas beyond the football stadium where the green is in the upper plan, that's a pretty steep grade. It's actually a very steep grade. There, it's almost a cliff there. And I don't think the drawings really communicate how dramatic some of that is. And I think the comments that have been made about the section to show that are, are spot on. That would be a useful drawing to have, I think, Paris. I also think that, I mean, for me, um, I think the study on the street is interesting. And I think that's actually something I would, I would want to see a little bit more of. Um, I think right now it's a little bit too timid. And I think it could actually be far more radical with that study. Um, you know, varying dimensions, varying uh, uh, programs that forefront that street, varying programs on the street itself. 
um, I think that you could actually start to, you know, right now the street, I very much appreciate that you had like those different studies of these different sections of these street types. Um, but for the most part, they're all sort of things that we've already seen and we have seen before, right? Like sidewalk with a road in the middle, a pedestrianized street, um, a one-way street, a two-way street, but like what more can you do with the street, I guess is my question. Like how is this thesis going to actually address what the nature of a street and the future of a city is. Um, and part of that for me also in conjunction with that is about landscape. Um, right now, again, in all these sections and drawings, you know, we just have the sort of like typical tree in a line or whatever, or even, you know, like the image that you showed in front of these pauses. I do like the idea that you have these two large pauses or these two large spaces, I should say, outside of the stadiums to capture um, the people that are going to be going to those those places, but you know, what if those are actually like large parks that then, you know, during a typical day can actually be used by by people to you know for for different other types of activities. So I think that for me, it, there would be a stronger integration of landscape within this that I think could layer on um, a whole new uh, a whole new idea to what a street and what a development can be. Yeah, I think you. You've done a really great job here reimagining the city. I think, that, again, I want to reiterate the, the image of the, the New York City street being pedestrian and activity biased rather than vehicular biased is, is a great motivation here. When I think about, and I'm completely buying to this you know, autonomous vehicle scenario you're talking about, but when you talk about these autonomous or intelligent systems like, like autonomous vehicle, uh, the temporal aspect of it, I think, is another opportunity, not just for you, but if, if we're going to go down this line 20, 30, 50 years, uh, I can imagine as increasingly we don't drive with maps, we drive with GPS. These autonomous vehicles are going to be more so. The idea that roads will be intermittent in direction, they'll be one way out will be one way in, especially for the stadium traffic, but on a daily basis, they could change. So to me, while I really appreciate your street section ideas, I agree, I think they need to be radicalized. The idea that even a vegetative median down the middle would limit the ability to change direction, change the usage and turn it into a bunch of different things. I can imagine the idea of uh, embedded LEDs in a kind of ubiquitous surface that could uh, allow one lane in and three lanes out or three lanes in and one lane out, or vice versa, turn it into a piazza, turn two lanes into a pedestrian way and two lanes in and out. The idea that the temporal switching and sensors uh, predicting activity, responding to activity, uh, producing activity by changing directions, I think that would be a fundamental piece of the city of the future relative to autonomous vehicles. And again, the idea that you know, we are, even us humans driving vehicles, we're increasingly dependent on technology that be, can be updated. Right now it's not updated by the minute, but we are not far from having that ability to feed map direction and porosity and transparency relative to changes of flow when we think about the city as a system. I mean, we're already starting to do it with our electric grid. Right? As you add solar to your house, you can be either pulling energy down, putting energy back up, charging a battery and putting back energy back up and putting energy into your house. And the way in which we're doing that within our domestic mm -hmm. spaces, soon we're going to be doing it at the urban scale and vehicular flow is going to be one of those. So uh, back to the comment about the bridge, I absolutely can imagine two lanes of that bridge could become built space. Like in, the, in the old traditions of bridges where they were occupied urban spaces, and the two lanes of traffic could be managed with uh, systemic traffic in a computerized way to accommodate stadium traffic on, on a game day versus everyday vehicular traffic and our morning and evening commutes uh, if, if we're doing something like that. So I, I commend the, the forward looking vision. I, I hope that we can find more solutions like this for our cities in the future. And as you said, it's just the unrealized economic potential of this amount of land this close to population is, is tremendous. So I commend you on the work and uh, just my only criticism would be that yeah, you have to imagine this even bigger and the consequences of something like autonomous driving has 10 collateral effects seen and unseen. Um, but I think it's a great job. That, you know, that ebb and flow of traffic, Mike, that you, you described, which you recall 
used to exist on Connecticut Avenue. It doesn't currently since quarantine. The um, lane changes have stopped, uh, but the lane changes, and, and they've only recently started doing the lane change again on Rock Creek Parkway. But the logistics of doing that have been so, you know, have, have historically been so difficult. I mean, it requires a whole team of park police to change the direction of a park right. to ensure safety. And what you're talking about is that it could be done almost in real time. There could be a kind of throttle down of one direction and throttle up. And the, and the vehicles themselves would, would know to stay right and, and, and occupy a single lane. So that, that kind of thing that today is it requires brute force to change and those X's, <laughs> which sometimes scare the hell out of me on, on Connecticut Avenue because people don't know what yeah. they're about, uh, could, could actually be something that's in, inherent. Much, in much more fluid, much more responsive. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Hey, hey, Paris, I had a, I, I wanted to commend you on an incredibly uh, thorough proposal. I was curious though, one of the edge conditions you haven't spoken much about is the river. I see you show a little bit of a water cut uh, to the east of the bridge that does not exist now, but I, I haven't been to Pittsburgh in a while, but I seem to recall a fairly summertime robust um, boat usage along that whole edge. So the ability to carve out and bring water into the site, the ability to kind of address, I believe there's a public pier, the ferry comes in just, just to the west of the bridge. So I'm just curious what your thoughts were on, on maybe a better connectivity to the water, given it's such an important feature in Pittsburgh. Yeah, um, so that's something that wasn't graphically very clear in this uh, presentation, but the southern portion of the whole um, development is a uh, riverfront trail. So that's very active, uh, especially in the really good weather, and people are enjoying the time out there. And one of the things that the, actually the city has as code in, in this part of the uh, district that all the buildings and views should be kept out towards the riverfront. So then there's a clear viewport out towards uh, the river and to the downtown. So we uh, tried to keep that in the urban design concept so that all the buildings are kind of um, aligned. So then there's a, a clear street out to the water so that connects people directly to the riverfront, but also the, the Heinz Plaza that we're calling at the east, uh, western side that directly opens up uh, to the uh, big waterfront and connects back directly to the uh, riverfront. Uh, and then we thought about, um, can we bring the water into the development and can we connect to the water directly? Um, there's about a 20 feet difference in height. Um, so it plays an advantage for any flooding on the site, but again, it was a little bit difficult to bring the water into the site um, for, for that matter. But that's a great point, uh, the water front. Yeah, Paris, to, to that point, and, and again, beautiful work. You know, I've known you over the years and I've seen your work and I'm not surprised at all at the level of, um, you know, thoughtful, uh, you know, completion that, that I see in your work. But I do have a question with regards to what um, uh, was just asked about the waterfront. Um, the premise of this thesis about sort of reimagining the urban street and sort of bringing people back uh, into the urban environment um, and pushing cars out, that idea, I think you could possibly explore in any kind of urban setting. It doesn't, it's not necessarily particular to this site. Because um, one concern I have about this site was raised earlier, first with the bridge coming in that sort of dumps any remnant of traffic that might be outside of autonomous vehicle into the middle of the site. But I also um, think of like a city like Baltimore City, right, where um, in the 60s and maybe 70s, the activity wasn't along the waterfront. It was like the, the urban living room was Charles Plaza, right? But once Rouse put a pavilion on the waterfront, the whole uh, attitude of the city shifted towards the water. And the water now became the urban living room, right? Which meant Charles Plaza, you can't pay anybody to put any kind of office in Charles Plaza. It's just dead. And I wonder if um, some, uh, you know, look at knitting the waterfront um, to the project in a much more uh, wholesome way wouldn't benefit your project. Because again, this is going to be in 10, 15 years. I, I was doing a project in Pittsburgh not too long ago across from the river. And I'm standing on the Mahan, Mahan uh, I can't say the name of the river quite 
well, when I'm standing on the precipice and looking, I'm going, wow. They Monongahela. Monongahela, me day. <laughs> yes. Monongahela, as well as the yeah, alligator, better. the other one. Um, you know, just sort of saying, wow, they have all these industrial waterfronts that are sort of slowly moving out. And now this is going to be the urban living room. And if such things were to happen in 10, 15 years, is it going to siphon the pedestrian and activity that you have in this main street that's so close to the edge of the water, is it going to siphon it away and push it towards the waterfront? And if it does, then what becomes of the street? Is it going to be just a dead street without retail and activity? Um, I wonder what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, so the, uh, the connections to the water um, was proposed with these uh, views out to the water and you know, the distance between the main street and the waterfront is only about 500 feet, very, very narrow. So it's very connected uh, in the beginning. But th there is an, a conversation before too that the waterfront was a big asset. So can we start to propose like water taxi connections that will become an, another mobility in the future uh, that connects directly into that central um, hub, uh, that transit hub in the middle? But the, the idea that we wanted to explore more was the, the, the driving force of the big changes that ha that's happening with autonomous mobility uh, and perhaps the green infrastructure can tie it even stronger back to the natural environment that's already there to the Southern portion of the, of the site. Um, but I think the, the, the green infrastructure that's proposed um, that's there today or with this, um, proposed design, I think uh, could have been benefited with a strong connection and even thinking about how we can keep people there with the uh, emergence of the waterfront um, properties in, in Pittsburgh. I mean, apart from the street design and, you know, or your good ideas, I think from the architectural urban design point of view, uh, maybe somebody has already mentioned, but the, the, the bridge should have been much more, you should have given much more importance than what you are showing here. And it seems strange that you arrive from the downtown uh, in, a, in, a, in that street, but the, the moment of arriving, there is not a sense of going from one place to another. There is no sense of a gate or uh, even from the bridge going immediately to the waterfront without necessarily going all the way to the main street and then going back to the waterfront, uh, you know. So that bridge assumes a little bit the, the, the look of an in infrastructure uh, with pillars and things and instead of having the potential for being treated as a street again, mostly a pedestrian street as well. And uh, with the sense of uh, going from one domain, the downtown area to another domain, but uh, enhancing the continuity of this link. Maybe the bridge should be designed all over. Maybe it's another thesis, I would say. Somebody has mentioned, you know, that there, it could be in an in, inhabitable bridge, but even if you don't go in that direction, there are examples of bridges, even the one in Rotterdam by uh, Van Berkel, somehow symbolically is a beautiful shape, is a beautiful uh, element that somehow enhance the connection, you know, just by the power of the architecture. Uh, this is seem a little bit like a standard bridge, you know, that uh, it doesn't, give uh, it doesn't uh, it doesn't profit for the potential that you could use i think it's a good point andrea and and i just put a big circle around the bridgehead on the main city side uh down by fort duquesne park and i'm just going to say to uh paris for the longest time for an entire semester the bridge went halfway across the river and we didn't get a chance to see how it landed on the city side of the river. And now today I'm seeing perhaps for the first time uh, the kind of infrastructure that's there is the kind of spaghetti that you, that bridgehead has to be redesigned as well. And it, and it, and it can't have the high speed bridgehead traffic onto it. Secondly, the fact that it's currently a double decker suggests exactly as everybody has suggested that the bridge itself could accommodate 
a lot of different kinds of activities as a single deck bridge that would would uh, have pedestrian activities and and mixed vehicular activities as well. There is a existing pedestrian um, bridge deck on the on the uh, west side, right? The, it drops down into the park. I liked Andrea's comment about you know um, if you that's an existing infrastructure now that I don't see on your plan that, that drops down and makes a connect a pedestrian connection directly to the linear park activating that waterfront. Yeah, yeah that, that, there's a, a pedestrian connection there today. Um, it's very unpleasant, actually. It's uh, very high in the air, right next to these highways. It's uh, very narrow, uh, barely a two person can walk by together. The new bridge that proposed that you're seeing here today um, it changed the whole deck system. So there's only two lanes for uh, a vehicle traffic, bike lane, and a pedestrian path passage. Um, the conversation about maybe this could be a place or have an economy, uh, the bridge itself is actually raised a lot higher than those bridges you see on the 7th, 8th, and 9th Street. Um, so then the, there's a challenge about how can we bring this down the bridge to the grade at a comfortable slope, um, but without changing too much of the infrastructure that's already there, uh, without making this another big project. Paris. Marcus, uh, go ahead. Yeah, uh, Paris, uh, fantastic job, man. I think um, <clears throat> um, on, on one note, I, I, I kind of want to see the sort of the economics of this because I just imagining how this would happen and, um, you know, the financing required for this, I think, is, uh, is, is it would be quite a feat. But I, I want to pick up on something really quickly that Brian and I think it was me, they said, um, um, I think, Brian, you took the words right out of my mouth. I, I was sort of thinking, you know, what you're introducing um, is essentially a typology, you know, I wrote down in my, my notebook here, a typology of repair, right? Because we could plop the strategy in, um, you know, you know, urban city USA, right? And, and, and I've been thinking about this a lot this semester, talking about freeways and what they've done over the course of, of you know, the 50, 70 years they've been sort of traversing our landscapes and you have different conditions. Um, you, have, you know, conditions where uh, these freeways sort of surround and create islands or they create their own sort of districts, uh, they separate, they bifurcate. And so you have these, in, you have these many conditions that, that exist in our American landscape. And I actually think the project, um, um, and, and my comment is more sort of where I think this should go because I think this problem exists, uh, um, you know, uh, in, a many, in many places in our landscape. I kind of think where this project should go is you sort of define what this typology of, of repair or, or intervention is, because you do have these myriad of different um, um, uh, situations that these freeways sort of exist in, right? You know, pit, this, this particular instance is, is, is one that um, it is unique to, uh, to Pittsburgh, right? But again, it, it exists in a different condition than in all these other places. So you yourself, I think this is a fantastic uh, proposal um, of how to reclaim you know, space uh, from a real estate perspective, uh, but also you know, the, the question of you know, uh, you know, what our cities become in, ter in terms of reclaiming that space back for people. And then the different types and the different ways and the different methods in which that takes place because of the different conditions in which these freeways have have uh, presented themselves in our landscape. Um, so, so my comments more of a, an applaud to to the approach, um, and and I do agree with some of the the, the comments that um, um, those that have have already mentioned in terms of you know expanding the realm of public space. I think that's spot on. Um, but I do think this sort of typology that you're beginning to create here um, could be expanded to show, you know, is it an additive or a subtractive process, right? Um, I think there's some instances in New Orleans where that's been sort of tried, um, um, you know, being more additive to what's there rather than completely removing the bridge. And there's been the, the, the inverse as well. So um, uh, overall, I think this is, I think this is a fan fantastic project that has a lot of uses and a lot of relevance um, in, in cities across the cities across the nation. So if, if I can add a little, I think this is a um, wonderful project and uh, the graphically 
uh, it conveys ideas really well. Um, and I think the one thing that I really, really want to command you about is that how the story was unfold at the beginning, um, starting from the juxtaposition of the olden days struck, you know, the street who occupies and how um, how it coexists with a uh, mode of tra travel as well as a pedestrian, um, and also the the comparison of the you know the daily number of travel of these highways compared to the um, the streets in um, in DC and kind of that data because if if we just saw it you know removing several major highways around the uh, around the city versus looking at the data and comparison of successfully achieving different mode of transportation that was kind of sealed the deal of you know you don't even need to um, argue one bit about possibilities of removing some of these um, redundant and outdated um, and even um, you know the oversized um, infrastructure so I think that was a that was a great start and I think what else is missing in terms of um, you know, what other, just like say, it, this can be the playbook of all um, other um, the American cities. There, you know, what else we are missing and, you know, paying attention, not paying attention to the real estate that can be developed and then pay, you know, bring it back to the pedestrians and humans and more activities. Um, and I think, you know, I, I have a project near that area is Riverfront and that is all about the topography and the vertical um, and even the way that you approach the water's edge is going to be different than other um, other cities that has a waterfront, like a Baltimore is a different than completely different way to interact. And that could be somewhat interesting. How do you see the vertically in that the river to the flat area and to the beyond uh, where you have another, um, the you know, maybe like a 20 um, more feet of vertical elevation changes. So how those things are all connected in, the, in, in a way, the sectionally, that is going to be very interesting, um, the chapter to see. But I think overall, um, I, I really like the approach of how the thesis is formed. I got a little lost on the, you know, the one of the diagram that you show that you know, electric vehicle versus regular vehicle versus autonomous vehicle, it doesn't really change in terms of the of the real estate that, that be utilized by car. Um, how does that, you know, the diagram is translated into um, this, you know, dumping into the autonomous vehicle is coexisting with the pedestrian. Um, so I think there is a little bit more of convinced, um, convincing story that goes with what type of technology is making things happening um, with the, the diagram that you showed as a, you know, in terms of the autonomous vehicle, it also has, it carries the same amount of, you know, real estate, it takes same amount of real estate. So there are a little bit of missing pieces, but I think overall, this is a very strong um, thesis and uh, it's, it's a, it is a beautifully developed. Well, one, one last note relative to that. And I think this is a, uh, this is a project I'd love to come back and revisit with you in 30 years, Paris, because uh, it's going to be interesting. There are a lot of people that hy uh, hypothesize that the autonomous vehicles are going to take up more room. Number one, because unlike our vehicles now, we're not generally going to park them and leave them somewhere. They're going to have to keep moving, and but they're going to keep moving only to get to charging stations or fueling stations, whether electric or hydrogen or whatever wins the power war. They think there's going to be a lot more. And unlike right now carpooling and sharing that many of these vehicles will be just one offs. So there'll be one person requesting a ride to one place to go to the next place. So there's a fear that like adding lanes to highways has only increased traffic over the years that autonomous vehicles are actually gonna take up more space in the urban realm and the, the roads are gonna be fuller than ever. So I love the optimism of this and I, I completely buy into the logic that you've put forward here. But this is one that someday Paris, 30 years from now, look me up on the internet and you can either say, I told you so, or you can say, damn, we should have seen this coming. That's the power of this project is you've actually bitten off something that's bigger than you're able to chew now. And you've chewed it really well for the knowledge and approximations you've given it. 
but it's going to be really curious to see what autonomous vehicles do to our city. Either it's going to be the pedestrian dream that you're hoping for and promising us here, or it's going to be something drastically worse and we're all going to wish we could go back to cars and gasoline and diesel fumes. But that'll be my last word for the thing. Great <laughs> job, Paris. I can't speak highly enough. That is the interesting aspect of thesis in a way it is a kind of parlor game and we don't know the future and we don't know where it will lead us. I kept thinking of this project throughout as a sort of back to the future project, but when we kept looking at Mulberry Street, I kept thinking, not Mulberry Street, I'm even further back and I'm thinking in my mind, this is a kind of infomercial for education abroad. I kept thinking about, well, Mike Ambrose and I must have had a pretty big influence on Paris when we took him, um, took him to Florence. And, and you know, clearly the, the, the football stadium is the Piazza del Duomo. And clearly the, uh, the PNC uh, ballpark stadium uh, Piazza is the Piazza della Signoria. And walking back and forth on that, on that cardo of the city uh, was clearly influential. On However, I know that uh, Paris is a man of the world, and he's been to many more places than that. So uh, the likelihood is that there are more models ro uh, uh, rolling around in his head. I want to introduce Matt Bell, who was the chair of this thesis committee. And Matt, could you bring us in for a landing? And then we'll have an open discussion here. Who's been patiently waiting. Um, congratulations, Paris. Um, it's kind of interesting to me the way this conversation went. I, I think... You know, one of the things that emerged in the course of all this stuff, talk about vehicles and, and autonomous vehicles and what street design is going to be like in the future, I think he's actually made a very beautiful, walkable neighborhood of something that's very interconnected and very nice. And, you know, a lot of really great places are congested. So I worry less about the congestion um, of aspect of this. You know, we see a lot of places in the suburbs that are not congested and they're not places that we would choose to live. So I think the fact that he's made a kind of really nice urban design plan, even outside of the autonomous vehicle question, I think in, in, in connecting these two stadiums and extending the downtown of Pittsburgh is, is really important. You know, the word radical is always interesting to me as well. And what architects think is is radical and what, what the public might think is radical. I suspect that if Paris took this to Pittsburgh and talked about tearing those ramps down and building a mixed use neighborhood here, that would be considered radical. And, and um, you know, aside from the points that have been made about the sort of street design and things like that, which I think um, I'm gonna comment about in a second, I think you, sometimes we lose perspective on that. I think the, the idea of dismantling this highway structure that probably never should have been put there in the first place, um, that is a lot less useful than the volume of traffic that gets carried on surface streets, um, is really, I think, the important radical move here. If you've ever been to Pittsburgh and walked across that bridge on the baseball stadium days, you know, the, the way in which that whole stadium engages the bridge and the waterfront and the downtown is really nice. And I think what this starts to do is extend the logic of that. Um, the other thing that's interesting to me about the whole uh, um, uh, discussion about the autonomous vehicles in the streets is that one of the things that COVID has brought us is a reconsideration of the public realm, particularly in Washington. We've seen a lot of streets where restaurants and other kinds of businesses have taken over public space in the street. And unfortunately, you know, this idea of flexibility, which I think is really interesting, has been sort of been hampered by the fact that a lot of these places are, are defined now by really ugly Jersey barriers. And if there's a way we can kind of figure out how to make our streets more flexible as Mike was talking about and, and have that sort of lightness of touch so it can be different things like Paris has presented, I think that's really gonna be a great way to get people to use the public realm in the future um, more than perhaps they do today. Um, I think Paris, one of the things that I, the last thing I'll say about this, and I think it's a very nice effort, terrific effort, started with this idea of the autonomous vehicles, but the place he chose kept popping its head up. In other words, um, you know, there's always this dialogue between the site and whatever intention you bring to the site in a thesis. 
And I think what's been interesting, and I think sort of people were sort of mining that crevice a little bit, that the intentionality and the investigation about what streets can become and landscapes and how the bridge could be something different was all things that sort of were at the front of his thoughts with regard to um, the impact of current technologies on the public realm. But then also once he started to pull on the thread of this neighborhood in Pittsburgh, um, all these questions about, well, do we really need these ramps? Do we really need these highways? What sort of neighborhood could we make here um, sort of presented themselves, which I think would probably be a pretty good urban design plan, even outside of the consideration of autonomous vehicles, if we even did something as boring as made the sort of typical streets that we make today. Um, the last thing I want to point out is that what I really enjoyed about Paris's thesis here is that um, it's really about what is the, these questions about how we as architects engage in the public realm. It's not a building design thesis, although buildings comprise it. But what I greatly admire about the effort is Paris took something that he really didn't have a whole lot of experience with. He had sort of one urban design studio. I think Brian's comments about travel are really important and said, how do architects impact the design of the public realm? How do we question it? How do we begin to sort of structure ourselves for the technological changes that are happening um, and, and be part leaders in that sort of um, thinking? And I, and, I, and I think that that's the sort of broad brush way of approaching what design can do at several different scales that we really try to encourage here with thesis projects with the students. So Paris, a job well done, good discussion, terrific graphics. And I think if this neighborhood gets built and I would encourage you to bring it to Pittsburgh to show it to people, um, I think Michael Lambros would be very pleased and want to go there and walk around. And the final thing I'll say is as a Steeler fan, it's always nice to see the environment around the stadium improved. So congratulations, Paris. And I guess, Brian, I'll turn it back over to you. Yes, thank you, Matt. And uh, folks, thank you all for your uh, participation this afternoon. I don't know, final closing comments. I know some of you have been with us all day long. Final closing comments. Thanks everybody for a great comment. Um, the conversation we had uh, was very spot on. Um, things we maybe briefly touched on before, but thanks again for a great comments. Well, I guess I'll jump in and start. Um, I think there were a great range of student interests that sparked each of these projects. And I think so, you know, we started the, the morning talking about refugees and the way a city might absorb or accommodate a refugee population and, and ending up here talking about technological uh, aspirations for the future and the consequences to our city. All these projects uh, really asked good questions and we're dealing with very timely pressing issues. So. I think the, the range of places you all chose to explore through architectural means uh, was really quite commendable in trying to make the world a better place. Well, well some of you folks from practice, do you see these folks as being ready to get out there? Well, I mean, uh, I, I, I think they are uh, they're very mature. The, the project I've seen, at least uh, three projects, they look very mature. They look uh, uh, visionary, but at the same time, practical students. You know, they, they have an eye on uh, possibility that are almost utopian on one side, but they try, they explain it in a way that they, may be convincing that those are not so utopian you know those are projects that can be implemented and uh, and in that sense i really appreciate this capacity of negotiating the two approaches you know <clears throat> maybe in the 60s when we were, we were young and radicals in the old ways we were more utopian and not so practical you know but nowadays I see a different approach and I think uh, overall it may be more valuable uh, at least uh, for realistic purposes. So really thank you for allowing me to participate at the jury and uh, congratulations to all the students. Brian, I think those with the dual majors in architecture 
or planning and real estate development are going to have a challenging decision to make. Yeah. As I've had a few developers hire away some of my talented architects recently. So that'll be a, a challenge to decide whether to go to the so-called dark side or stay in design. Not that you can't balance both. It's, it's not the dark side as our, as, as our real estate program would argue. And certainly we hope that our real estate program prepares everybody for the bright side of life. We know they do. Good. Thanks oh, for saying that, <laughs> Brian. <laughs> I, saw, I saw your camera come on, Maria. <laughs> Taking a bullet. <laughs> I really um, appreciated, um, Fariz, I really appreciated a lot of your comments. And um, I think there's a way of really, how do these ideas really um, get invested into architectural explorations? Uh, I think that's a place that we could really push some of these um, ideas forward and think about how, again, like what does it mean uh, to take on um, an aging population or intergenerational population in terms of opportunities in architecture? How do we think about, you know, the streets and the negotiations that are happening with old forms of movement and new forms of movement? And so. Um, I look forward to taking these ideas and kind of continuing in that direction, um, you know, as we really think about how it's based in our discipline on these really important questions. So thank you. Yeah, I guess I'll just jump in. I would say, you know, it's exciting to see the work and congratulations to all the students and thank you for sharing um, all of your theses. It's nice to see and, um, you know, I, I, I've said it, I say it all the time to any student that I pretty much uh, talk to, which is, I think, you know, push yourself to do things um, and stay nimble in your design. Um, and just, you know, the, the best thing we can do as architects is remain excited. And the more questions that we ask, I think the better. Uh, so thank you again. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I, I, so first, I want to say is that I that definitely don't don't look at development as the dark side. Uh, hopefully, you keep the same uh, optimism that you have in architecture. I guess, I would, and I say optimism. Well, you know, speaking on Fareed's point is is wanting to be safe, but you know, safe doesn't necessarily push society ahead. It's like these really bold thinking. And for those of you who are going into development, please maintain and continue to develop some really bold thinking. Uh, the way that I personally operate in practice is that there is a like this blurred between you know urban design on multiple scales, and I think the best architects are, are designers and thinkers for that point. And I, it's it's important for you to continually think, think bold. Uh, whether regardless of the discipline, I think what we're seeing now is a lot of our disciplines are becoming blurred. Um, I've had the pleasure of seeing a lot of uh, not your particular work, but the work from your school and in other studios. And I'm really impressed in kind of the ideations of the projects, uh, the presentation style, um, and how thoughtfulness, uh, thoughtful you guys are in terms of can this actually get constructed? Uh, and in some case, I, that may have been a, an albatross in pushing some of these things forward. Uh, I, it's tough to say this now because you're going into the practice where you have to continually think about that, those things. But I, I just urge you to like, again, try to think outside of the box, ask bold questions, try to find interesting solutions. The best, as we're seeing here, some of the best uh, critiques that we have are the ones where, you know, maybe some jurors don't agree or it, 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 it engenders another set of questions that you may not have thought about. Uh, I think those are the best projects are the ones that, have, that we're able to have a lot of discourse on and it will be the best projects that you have in practice as well. Well, there you have it, folks. I want to thank Maddie. You want to talk? There, go put your hand. Oh, I, I just wanted to say I, I think that we've had a terrific uh, conversation today among the critics. And if we have to find silver linings in Zoom, I think we found two today. One is that, uh, you know, we really had a terrific group of critics who, uh, uh, you know, um, 
uh, didn't have to be physically present. So I think it made it uh, easier to assemble this, this great group. And the second thing is, I heard every word you said, which is, is very <laughs> different from uh, <laughs> what happens in the great space. So uh, yeah, thanks, thanks critics and thanks students for a really wonderful um, day of presentations and discussion. We, we've moved from a Latin mass into a uh, more evangelical kind of uh, discussion of architecture. For those of you that don't know, usually the critics have their backs to a room full of over 100 people. And we, we suddenly replicate the episode of, uh, of Seinfeld, the low talker episode, where every critic becomes a low talker. So, folks, I want to thank all of you uh, here today. This has been... Uh, certainly uh, a great day. Uh, thank you to Fabian uh, Gomez, who has been working behind the scenes to keep us live uh, uh, online. Thank you uh, very much uh, to Lindsay uh, for uh, making sure that the, the actual production worked the way it was supposed to work and uh, keeping us moving along. I want to I want to recognize uh, one of our colleagues, Carl Bovel, who has been instrumental throughout the years in making sure our thesis program worked, a, a, a great colleague uh, teaching in architectural technologies. Carl's going to be, uh, after this week, he's going to be retired and he's going to be living in an idyllic environment on the West Coast. So thank you, Carl. These, these, um, these emerging architects that we've seen today have had to overcome a lot in the course of getting to where they got to today. Uh, certainly, COVID was not quite expected by any of us as to where we'd be today. That made us adopt new tools. Some of those new tools were not things that all of us were entirely familiar with and ready to use, but we've, we've overcome that and found out these new tools can be quite, uh, quite liberating uh, and quite inclusive, bringing people in from afar and from different time zones uh, Andrea, it must be time for uh, a, a grappa or something there. Um, and, uh, you know, we've this has been a tough period, too, because we've been wrestling with issues of social justice all throughout our thoughts as we've been trying to work a day, daily life, uh, particularly here in the context that we're in, in the Washington, Baltimore area, where we're right in the thick of just about everything that's been going on. I think there's light at the end of the tunnel, I hope, I pray. Finally, uh, the loss of a colleague. Um, you know, in July, when I talked to Carl about uh, his health, uh, Carl had said that uh, he was uh, going to be teaching the studio come hell or high water. I think that was his actual words. Um, and he believed it. At the time, I could tell from the strength of his, in his voice that wasn't likely to be the case. Uh, I think that everybody here has done Carl proud, as somebody mentioned earlier on. I think it was Min. Uh, I think Carl is looking down at us at the moment saying um, that looks like the urban train is, has left the station. So thank you all and uh, have a great uh, winter break. Uh, hope to see some of you uh, back again soon. Thank you to the reviewers from afar for spending the time with us. Be well. Thank you, thank you Brian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.